last last time a very good question was asked and it's a question that is a perennial one why why go clear back to the greeks and back to the uh, Egyptians and so on, is that important? Is it important to what we're trying to learn now? Well, actually, maybe I could try, I don't know that I can answer it except in this fashion, that nothing is really absolutely essential for you to do. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't have to do anything about even going to college or high school, if you will. Uh, it's, a, it's a desire that enters some of us and some of us don't want to do it. it. It's a purely optional thing. And so I would have to answer that question this way, that to me, and I hope that most of you people in here, that at least there is something to be gained in an attempt to understand what went before, at least to try to get some continuity to our existence, to our culture, that there is a history and maybe, maybe we can learn, I don't know. Uh, I believe it was um, um, Bertrand Russell. I may be wrong on this, but he said there's one thing that we can learn from history, and that is that we don't learn. And in many respects, that's true. We keep repeating over and over some of the mistakes. Now, now let me put it this way. <clears throat> in the things that I've had to say so far, <clears throat> I've primarily been directing our attention to what we might think of as scientific ideas. Now you have to remember, folks, because this question was also brought up at the same time that science was developing in, let's say, in the Greek culture, there were other things developing too. Pericles was also developing the ideas of great sculpturing. The, the, the Parthenon, the Acropolis, all of these things were developing in Greece at the same time, but we're not particularly addressing those questions, but they all make up a history of our culture. There is, there is a price we pay to learn, and the more we learn, the more difficult it is. There, there is an obligation on me, on Dr. Cole, on Dr. Chismar, on all of you, to pay for this learning, and there's difficulty. For example, uh, Doug, I'm, I think I'm right on this, that it was Aeschylus, I believe, in the Agamemnon, who said, God whose law it is that all who learn must suffer. And that pain which will not stop falls drop by drop upon our heart. And against our will, no matter how hard we try, wisdom will come through the awful grace of God. Uh, at least he, he had some substance of that. There is a price we pay. The more we learn, the more difficult, the more responsibility we have. Now what I'm trying to do here, as best I can, and there are thousands of other illustrations, if these gentlemen were presenting it, they would have others, I'm sure. But I mentioned, I want to start and then try to get into the ideas of Bacon and Descartes in the Renaissance. Let me go back just very briefly to Aristotle Oops. and Ptolemy. Because here I think would be a place where we can then jump into the Renaissance. Now, Aristotle, as I've said, did a lot of good observing. There's no question, but in the field of biology, he made contributions. He developed the logic of the syllogism and so on. Now, here's what I wanted to use and see if I can make it clear. I hope I can. There were, there were three things in the philosophy of Aristotle. I've mentioned really one. But just to briefly mention them again, Aristotle, as well as uh, postulated this geocentered system. Now what he meant by that was the earth is the center of our universe, if you will, or at least of our solar system. Then 
We're not quite sure how these, but I'll, I'll toss them in, because these three occupied the attention of the philosophers all the way through. This, and these were about 300 BC. The problem of a vacuum. Now, Aristotle believed that nature abhorred a vacuum, that there was no such thing as having total emptiness. Nature would come in and fill it. Now, we're not sure what promoted this, but this was something that remained really for uh, the Renaissance period, Pascal in particular, to show that, uh, that nature doesn't abhor a vacuum, that we, we have a barometer, as you folks know, and that is a vacuum existing above a column of mercury. But nevertheless, they were concerned with the vacuum. And number three, with the path of a projectile. Now, in, 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 to me, it's interesting that here were the three major, three of the very major things that these people uh, were concerned with. Today I'm going to primarily work on this. But by the projectile, remember I made the point that to the Greek mind, the circle was the most important, significant type of geometric form. Therefore, everything should travel in a circle. Now, there have always been people who are curious. And you folks are curious about certain things. And, and the Greek mind was a very curious mind. And they, they, they noted this. They noted, for example, that when a projectile is fired, that it goes more in the arc of a parabola. But if the circle, if the circle is the perfect geometric form, then why didn't that projectile, the, the stone that is being thrown or catapulted against the wall, why didn't it travel in the arc of a circle? And the only thing that the Greeks could say was this, that maybe as this, as this object is fired from the catapult, air pressure holds it back and puts it into this, this parabolic form. That's the best they could say about it. Now, here, here's another place where, where people have observed, starting with the Egyptians and with the Greeks, and let me go now to this geocentered system. They pointed this out. First of all, the Earth is the center. The Earth doesn't move. Then they had perfect circles. Not that, but that's what it's supposed to be. Then they had the sun. Then they had the planets. Now let me take two of them. Let's say Mars and, uh, well, I'll say here's Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Now, they were very, very careful observers. Now, here's the point I want to get, and then I'm going to try to show you how we finally get answers to a question. Now, these people noticed <coughs> that as they watched the motions of these planets, for example, they figured now they have to travel in the arc of a, great, of a circle. And they're traveling around the Earth. So they would go out night after night after night and watch things. You have to be interested in astronomy to do it. Then they noticed a very interesting thing. As they watched those, they noticed, let's say that Mars, down here we are on the Earth, we're watching the path of Mars, <clears throat> night after night. And they noticed a very strange thing, that this planet would be moving along here, and it would be a certain place, as I'd say, as an evening star. And then all of a sudden, as they kept track of this, it would look as if that planet was moving, and then it would turn around and start going backwards. It was called a retrograde motion. It was moving along just very nicely. Then as you watch it, it would seem to turn and go backwards over a long period of evening uh, observations. <coughs> now you might say, well, so what? Well, to many, it didn't make a bit of difference. It was up there. Others said, is there any way we could explain that? Well, Ptolemy said this. Ptolemy developed, he was the great astronomer of this time, and he wrote a treatise called the Almagest. And in this, in this geometrical 
treatise, Ptolemy said, I think I can explain this. He took all these observations and he said, here we are. We're down here on the Earth. The planet is moving. And he said, it's moving in a forward direction. Fine, everybody's happy. But he said, then the planet looks, it just looks as if it's going backwards because it's following the path of a minor circle. And so it's not traveling as you might think, but it's traveling in what are called epicycles, E-P-I-C-Y-C-L-E-S. Now he said, this will explain it, because he said, as you stand down here on the Earth, that planet is moving, but when it's down here, now don't forget, they're far up in the sky, and you don't see these circles. You just see the thing as if it's flat on, on the surface. He says, when that planet goes into this circular motion, to you it looks like it's going backwards, and it really is. Then it comes back here, and now it's okay. So he, he built up a very, very complex system of epicycles. Because, look folks, this he had to do if he was going to continue to say the Earth is the center. It was the only way he could explain this so-called retrograde motion. Now that was about somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 BC. And that became the dominant thought. It was accepted by everybody, by the church fathers. Now the church fathers in particular, and they're sincere, they meant well. They, they said this is a good idea because the earth has to stand still. Man is the essence, the greatest thing that God created, and he is at the center of the universe or the center of this solar system, so the earth must be that place. And if man is there, he's so ego-centered that that would have to stand still. Now, <clears throat> you know, folks, that held. These ideas prevailed up until, <clears throat> at least until 1400 AD, about 1500 years. And Aristotle was the ultimate authority. In fact, if people ask a question, the philosophers and the so-called scientists and so on would say, well, what does Aristotle have to say about it? If Aristotle says this, it must be true. But don't forget Aristotle had said, if you, if you drop two stones of differing weight, one weighs five pounds and one one pound, that stone that weighs five will get to the earth five times as fast because it will have five times the desire to get there. Aristotle said it. It's got to be true. Now, now all of this data, now here's the, here's the crux of what I'm saying here right now. All of this data that Ptolemy had taken represents patient observation over a long period of time and the gathering of what we call facts. Now, now look, you as a person back in the period of Aristotle and Ptolemy or sitting right here in this room, you have to be willing to accept these things that we say as facts. If you don't accept them, our arguments are no good. Now, you, you better believe it, <coughs> that in this period of time with Aristotle, everyone believed what Aristotle said. He was the ultimate authority, if you will. Now, and we had the facts to prove it. Now, you might, you might say, well, then what else is there? Now, here's where, here's where I call, I'm going to jump around here now, and we'll keep coming back to other things, the curiosity. Look. You can't stop people from being curious. We all have a curious mind. We want to know. We don't, we don't like to be conned. I get so disgusted. I don't know what you think about this. But <clears throat> you, the president, for example, of the United States is going to give a talk or a, an address to the nation. And it, it's, it's just damned upsetting to have that person give that talk. And as soon as he's done, have all of these news commentators, I don't care what channel, immediately come on and say, now don't worry about what he said. We will tell you what he said, and we'll explain it to you. 
how stupid do they think we are? Uh, don't worry, we'll tell you. Now, you know, down through the years, <coughs> there have always been, there's been this tendency to say the great mass of people should not know. Keep it from them. Because if you tell them, don't, don't, don't let them become too educated. If they become educated, they'll become more curious, and we'll soon see what happens. Keep them from learning. Tell them, tell them all that they need to know, and we'll be a lot better off. You can't do that. People are curious. They want to know, most of us at least. Now, now look, here for 1,500 years, for 1,500 years, these facts that have been gathered on the motion, the retrograde motion of the planet held sway. About, no, I'm not sure exactly about the date, but about 1,470, no, that's plus or minus, AD. Uh, uh, close to the time when Columbus set out to sail to America. Polish monk, and, and I might mention too that almost all these people, as we come into the Renaissance period, uh, Galileo, Kepler, Copernicus, Sir Isaac Newton, all of them were trained first and foremost in theology. That was the dominant training uh, schedule. Now about this time, I say I'm not sure on my date there, <coughs> but Copernicus, now look, this is almost 16 or 1700 years that everybody accepted these facts. But there was always somebody who was not quite satisfied. So Copernicus comes along. Now he's got some people to worry about. And you, know, and you have to be careful how we say this because everybody is sincere. But the church fathers, be they at that time predominantly the Catholic faith, Martin Luther hadn't come along yet. But predominantly, they were sincere when they said, we accept these facts of Ptolemy for this reason, because we know that the earth has to stand still, and these facts explain that. Now, Copernicus thought long and hard. But look, here's what he said to himself, rather quietly. He said, this, this, system of explaining, it, it seems so complex. These epicycles just don't make sense. Yet there are the facts to prove it. Now Copernicus said, couldn't I simplify? Couldn't I simplify this thing if I do a very simple ju jump? Now it wasn't very simple, but it was a poetic leap of, of his imagination. He had nothing, in, nothing to, ba to base it on, but he said, let's, let's let the sun and this was a pretty big statement to make in the face of 1,500 years. <coughs> Let's let the sun be the center of our solar system, and let's let the earth, now he still adhered to the circle. He, he had no more information. Let's let the earth travel around the sun, and let's let Mars and these other planets travel around the sun, if we'll do this, we can have us we can greatly simplify what Ptolemy said. He meant well, but Copernicus says, look, if we will do this, now it's nothing more than two planets traveling around the sun, and one of them's traveling, each of them travels at its own speed. We we can do that. They always were able to tell how long it took the Earth to go around the, the sun. We call it a year and a year of Mercury, and so on. Now he said, when, when these are traveling, suppose, suppose that Mars, I'm making this much more simple, but he says that suppose that Mars passes the Earth. Now if it does, it would be like you sitting in a railroad station, and you're ready to, for that train to take off. And have you ever noted, if you've done that, or you're riding down the highway in an automobile, and someone goes around you, and you just sort of instantly look out of your eye, it looks as if you're going backwards. 
Or the other, if you're passing the car and you look out, it looks like the fellow you're passing is going backwards. Or if you've been in a, a railroad train and you're sitting there and you're looking at the platform at the station, sometimes the train starts out so easily that for a brief time you think the railroad station is going backwards. It's a relative thing. And so Copernicus says, look, if we will let the Earth travel around the sun, then we can do away with all of this stuff. Well, that's a pretty big mouthful because it, it, did, much, it did much to simplify astronomy, but it kicked in the face of all belief that the Earth was the center. Now, about this same time um, that, that Copernicus did this, Martin Luther was coming into the picture. Now, now Luther was about to write his theses and put them on the door of the, of the uh, monastery. But look, Luther said this. He said, Copernicus can't possibly be right. Now, you have to remember that Luther is sincere. He, every one of these things that are being said and done are by sincere people wanting to get in some way wanting to find the truth. Everybody's searching for the truth. Now, now Luther says Copernicus has to be wrong because Elijah, I think it was Elijah, Elijah didn't command the earth to stand still. He commanded the sun to stand still in the Old Testament. Joshua. Joshua, right, thank you. He commanded the sun to stand still. Therefore, the sun must be moving. So don't go on what Copernicus has to say. And, and so you see, and that was said in all good faith. Now, now, with that in mind, what I've tried to do here is this. And here's where the whole system of science begins to take some meaning. And we'll take some other examples. Look, we collect, no matter what it is, a bunch of facts. In this case, they were facts gathered by Ptolemy to explain the positions and motions of the planets. Then somebody, in this case, Ptolemy. Ptolemy was the person here. Ptolemy takes all of these observations and he proposes, he proposes what we'll call a theory. Now, how does he get to that? Well, we say, by a process of reasoning, which the Galileo would call induction. In other words, I've got a whole mass of data. Now, now isn't it true, if I just have a pile of data, it, it's absolutely worthless. It, it, suppose, let's say here, that we decide someday, uh, I don't know who, Dr. Cole says, hey kids, let's do this. Let's really collect something. Let's collect some data. Um, how about you 10 people for all the rest of your life? You collect all the daily stock market reports, the ups and the downs. And you 10 people collect all the variations in weather. And you people over here collect all the ages of all the particular group of people when they're born, when they die. Let's just collect every bit of facts we can possibly gather. And we're going to do it for the next, well, as long as any of you are alive. And the last one who is alive gives those, oh, there must be room, houses full of facts. You take them down and give them to, uh, to the um, National Library in Washington, D.C. Here's our life's work. And so you hire trucks to go down and ha take all those facts and look, look what we've done. We spent a lifetime gathering all these facts and you put them there and you walk out. I, I don't doubt at all, but what the curator of that library would say, well, haul them on out and back. We got plenty of shredders in Washington, shred them up, get rid of them. We, they're no good. Unless somebody, unless somebody can take that list of facts and come up with some kind of a theory, they're no good. Then we do something else. Now when that theory is proposed, 
the theory always makes some people mad. We don't like change. We get angry. It, it, we get complacent. <coughs> don't change. You hear so many older people say, uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Don't try to change the thing. Let things be as they are. It won't stay that way. Heraclitus says everything's changed. You, you, you can't live in a static world. It's always changing. Now, therefore, when that theory is proposed, in this case, Ptolemy proposed this a series of epicycles. Then somebody always wants to disprove it. And I, I think that we could substantiate this statement that no theory, maybe we can say more about this as we go on, no theory can be looked on as scientific unless it's possible to falsify it. In some way, over a long period of time, there has to be some way that you can falsify it. Otherwise, it's not scientific. If I say to you, it will never, 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 never rain in Death Valley, that's not a scientific statement. Because none of us will ever live long enough to see if that's true. But if I say to you, it will not rain in Death Valley for the next 10 years, that could be accepted as a scientific statement because the chances are that some one of us will be alive and see whether it rained. If I say God is, there is no God, that's not scientific, can't prove it. If I say there is a God, that's not scientific, it's a faith, it's a statement of faith. So we have to be careful, but we do do this. When we get this theory, we generally apply wherever possible now this is the language, and the more mathematical we can make it, the more logical, the more scientific it is. We try that, and then we try to verify this thing by a process that we call <coughs> deduction. We try to get verification. Now here's where the trouble is. If, if everything we do tends to verify this, it's great. But inevitably, look folks, inevitably, the more we tr strive to try to verify that thing, the more one of you guys will upset the apple cart. One of you will come along and you will do some kind of an experiment to gain a fact, another fact to verify this original thing, just like Copernicus. It'll be what I call a leap of imagination, a poetic leap, uh, something which is what Plato called a dream uh, or a, a mental gymnastic, a mental breakthrough. And you'll find that here comes a fact which distorts or tends to break down this theory. So we start all over again. And we just keep going round and round, trying to use induction, deduction, and come up with this theory, upset it, that's the way we progress. Copernicus proposed this theory, to, not that he wanted to, but he said it'll make it a little bit easier. And so he upsets Ptolemy. Copernicus, Copernicus comes along, but notice, Copernicus is still in trouble to his, to his dying day. Copernicus argued that these planets traveled around the sun but they had to travel in circles. Well, that was fine. We accepted that until good old Sir Isaac Newton came along and proposed an idea which made it possible to change the, those circles into elliptical paths. That tended, now we still stuck to the fact that the planets traveled around the sun, but we, we modified Copernicus and put it over into an elliptical path. Now, what does all this add up to? Well, here. We went, to, to go back to what I've been saying about the Greeks, the Greek culture, in terms of science, sort of came to an end about 200 BC. <coughs> then, then Rome, Rome came into the picture. Rome offered very little in the way of scientific advancement. They, they used much of the Greek idea, but the Romans were great legalists. They did some marvelous building and so on. So we can't discount the contributions they made. 
But then, Dr. Cole, we were talking about this the other day. For some strange reason, we get to a very great height in our culture. That was true. Remember, we're talking about Babylon and the Chaldeans and Egypt and then Greece. And then something happens that it seems to die out. Or, or it, uh, you can't really say die out, but, but it, it tends to stop and slow down. And we go into a period of lethargy, whatever it is. It happened here about 400, at least, what, Rome fell around 400 AD, something like that. Then there seems to be a, a break. Now, uh, you folks in your history probably called it the period of the Dark Ages, up to about, for about a thousand years. The first one to come back about 1419 was Leonardo. And Leonardo is probably the greatest single Renaissance total person that ever lived. He was not, ju he was not just a, si uh, a painter, he was an engineer, a sculptor, a painter, uh, an inventor. Maybe we'll have time to say a little about him later on. But, but about this time, things began to happen. Now, to be honest, to be fair, we ought to say this. We, we don't say it too much about it in terms of our history. But you know about 1100, let's see, um, <clears throat> William the Conqueror went over in England about 1066. About 100 years after that, somewhere around 1150, when Henry II had gone down to Aquitaine, married Eleanor of Aquitaine, his sons had two, two notable sons, Richard the Lionhearted and King John I. But this was about 1150. Now about, about 800, AD, the Moors from Morocco went across the Straits of Gibraltar and went over into Spain. Now I notice that I'm sitting here about 600 years before this. And I think we have to do this to give some credit to it. The Moors decided that they were going to carry the religion of Islam throughout all of Europe. They started over in Spain. And you know, to me, it's fascinating that from about 800 to about this time of Henry II, about 1150, in that period of about 300 years, the Moors went into Spain and Cordoba, or Cordoba, became the center of total enlightenment. Now, now when, when, when this was, this was about, about the time of Henry II, uh, uh, that they had reached this state. Uh, you know, at this, at this time, not up until about here, the University of Cordoba had about 500,000 volumes of books. They had all the Greek writings. But had it not been for the Moors, for, it, for the Mohammedans of that period, all of, all of this Greek culture would have been destroyed for all practical purposes. They preserved it. And in Cordoba, during this period of about 300 years, the Koran, the Koran was there. Now it's over in Mecca. But, for example, in this period of 11, around 1150, Cordoba had uh, lighted streets. About The main street of Cordoba had about 10 miles of streets that were lighted. They had beautifully constructed buildings and mosques and so on. And you know, at this time, about 1150, the University of Cordoba had about 500,000 volumes. And there was a little university being started in Paris called the University of Paris. And they had approximately 100 volumes. And, and uh, Oxford University was getting started about this same time over in England. And they had less volumes than that. They just had, the culture had not begun to become alive. then. About 1400, we notice at that time this thing called the Renaissance. And it was during this period, about halfway through 1400, that Copernicus gave his ideas of the structure of the solar system. Then there was a lot happened. We, we can't really mention it all. But 
Um, I wanted to say a, a period that goes along here up to about 1625 to 1650, and there are two names. Now this is the 17th century. This, this period is this, what Whitehead calls the century of genius. And I wanted to mention two names here. I think we can do it. Uh, Sir Francis Bacon. and René Descartes. Now there's some other names we need to get in, but these two are in line with what we've been talking about the whole hour. Bacon, an Englishman, Descartes, a Frenchman. Now Bacon says, thinking about, he, he was definitely uh, uh, influenced by, uh, by Pythagoras, by Aristotle, but he didn't have too much to say for the poetic mind of, of uh, a Plato. Bacon says this, that if we're going to move forward, we have to have lots of people gathering facts. In fact, now here's the big difference between these two people. Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon argued, if we're going to learn anything, first of all, knowledge is power. Uh, Descartes argued too, it's, it's worthwhile to have knowledge, it's a powerful thing. Now, both of these men argued that mankind will be very altruistic, we're very good, and we'll never gain any knowledge and use it for the wrong purposes. Uh, they were pretty naive. Uh, no matter what we learn, we'll only use it for good. Well, this is not true, but nevertheless, Bacon argued we gather facts, and notice as I had this on the board, then Bacon says by a process of induction, we'll come up to an explanation or some kind of a theory. Call it a theory, if you will. You might say, could we ultimately develop it into what we'll call a law of nature? Well, there are very, very few laws of nature, but uh, at least we can come up with a theory. But he, ar he argues that it's induction. Now, Bacon says the only way we're going to do this is to get lots of us involved. So he suggests setting up a gigantic structure which can house these people. He called it, set up the House of Solomon. Uh, this, what he meant was a big research, if you will, a big research institution. Actually, from this suggestion of Bacon about 1650 came the Royal Society of London. And we have uh, research societies, the Biological Society, the American Chemical Society, we say if we're going to gain knowledge, we have to have lots of people gathering facts. Now, as I said before, if all you do is gather facts, that's not enough. You've got to have someone in this, if we're gathering facts all together here, there has to be one of you who will be able to see what all this stuff means and induce some kind of a use of it. Otherwise, it's no good. So we'll put it, we'll, we'll come, we'll, we'll universalize it. We'll, we'll put it into something that is useful. Now, Descartes, Descartes is Neoplatonic. Descartes starts out, in fact, I, I think we could say that the first most useful idea in research really comes from Descartes. And it appears in his famous book on the Discourse on Method. It's probably one of the most significant books in the field of science ever written. Now Descartes starts out, he's a very shrewd mathematician. In fact, Descartes, I think, is, uh, was the inventor of analytical uh, geometry. And, <clears throat> and, and Descartes says, as a young person, I became curious about the nature of the universe. But how am I going to get started? And after, now he was trained theologically as well. But after thinking and thinking about it, he says, I finally came to the real, realization of this. I think, therefore, I am. Now he said, I doubted everything. I got my start by casting out everything. I just refused to accept anything in the past as true. 
I doubted everything. Now he says, then I came up with the idea, I think. Therefore, I am. Now some said, well, how do you know it wouldn't be I am, therefore I think. But that wasn't Descartes. Descartes said, the only way I can do this is to cast up, doubt everything. Then, now how did it all get started? How can it get started? He postulates God. God helped me to get started. He's the divine starter. What, what Aristotle called the first cause. Uh, uh, Descartes has this. Now, now Descartes becomes the one who uses the second part. Descartes says, we're going to move forward by getting ideas. All the facts in the world mean nothing unless you can use them. You come up with a theory, but then there's something lacking. You see, even, even Bacon had to, re had to recognize this. Bacon recognized that no matter if he did use induction, he couldn't escape this curious thing, this leap of imagination, this flying in the face against all the facts to come up with the ideas such as Pythagoras, uh, as uh, Copernicus did. So even Bacon had to use some of the, rec recognize some of the need for, for the mental gymnastics that go on when we think up what we're going to talk about. Bacon argued, I'd rather just in the quiet of my room as a very solitary person. He was a very solitary man. He didn't want people around. He would in no way, Bacon wouldn't be happy in a research institute. I mean, excuse me, Descartes wouldn't be happy in a research institute. He wants to work by himself. Einstein did that. So too did Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, these great thoughts, these great leaps of imagination came from solitary thinkers. And in fact, uh, Max Planck suggested the great person, he, he was one of the persons who influenced Einstein. And Planck says, I'm convinced that the angel of the, of the Lord tapped Einstein on the shoulder. Every so often, people say, I look back to see if I'm about to be tapped. Not too many of us are. There aren't too many Leonardos, too many Einsteins, Da Vinci's, Michelangelo's, Beethoven's, and so on. He does tap a few. Well, Descartes says, we've got to use this mental leap of imagination. We work in a solitary way to come up. But as I, as I think we've shown here before, it's a circuitous thing. You have to have induction. You have to have deduction. And invariably, as you move forward, you'll come up with some fact. Well, uh, someone said, the worst thing that can happen in the field of science is to have an ugly fact rear its head and destroy a beautiful hypothesis. That's what happens over and over and over again. And then we start over. We don't get discouraged. The Greeks, the Greeks recognize this. Uh, maybe, maybe, um, I use this as, as a myth. The myth of Sisyphus. Uh, Albert Camus wrote a whole treatise on it. Look, the Greeks said uh, Sisyphus was condemned by one of the gods to roll a, a, a stone up the hill. But he was, he was condemned to this terrible thing that he would push, work on that stone as hard as he could and when he would get it up just to the top of the hill, there would be something happen. It would fall out of his hands and go back down the hill again. Now, the Greeks recognized this, and this is what happens to all of us. When we're down at the bottom of the hill, about to start over, by gosh, I'll make it this time. That's when we're at our strongest. When the football team is down a touchdown and one minute to go, they are at their strongest. Desperation comes in. They'll work hard. They're at their worst when they're up here, when they're number one, because a hubris, an egotism sets in, takes hold of them, and they let down, and sure enough, it falls back down. That happens to all of us. And the Greeks recognized it. And that's true in science. And inevitably, when that thing comes along, a new idea comes along, it destroys a beautiful hypothesis, but we don't give up. We start in and we work again. Now, there's one, <coughs> there's one thing I'd like to do 
if we have a chance. One of my favorite uh, mystery stories, maybe you've read it, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Okay, now in that, that's written by Sir Conan, Arthur Conan Doyle, who is, himself was a trained doctor of medicine. If anybody uses induction, deduction correctly, Doyle does. And he does a beautiful job in The Hound of the Baskervilles. If we have time, we'll try to work that in. That's all I have time for you. Thank you.